The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming in. Um, I'm super stoked to be here. This is, this is my third year in a row at uh, Self, and so uh, thanks for having me back again. Lots of familiar faces here. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, like jump right in. Uh, today we're talking about how, like how to write great modules. Uh, how many folks in here uh, consider themselves developers? I see a show of hands. Okay, so about half half, half the crowd. Um, how many people here write puppet code? It's uh, about half. Uh, uh, all right, uh, like keep your hands up. Uh, like how many people write puppet code? Uh, is your code publicly accessible? Uh oh, hands are starting to drop. Is it on GitHub? Cool. Uh, do you write spec tests? And now all the hands are down. All right. So uh, probably no continuous I integration then. Uh, yeah. So, uh, like my experience with uh, with Puppet, uh, I've been I've been using Linux it's 15 years now. Uh, Puppet since 2007. Uh, I wrote uh, a bunch of like Puppet code uh, in order to automate building out a uh, VoIP platform. Uh, so I had a lot of kit that I put in different cities, and we didn't have any configuration management. I was like, how am I going to get this done? My uh, time frame keeps like moving in and not out, and uh, we keep getting more requirements. So. I uh, started using Puppet, and away I went. Uh, fast forward a few years, I started working for Puppet Labs uh, as a professional services engineer, uh, now consulting on my own. Cool. So uh, the litmus test for writing uh, good code is, uh, can someone else use your code without modification? Right. If, if you have to edit the code to use it, it's not good code. And so uh, what, what keeps us from having uh, like great code that people can use without modification is generally data inside the code. Um, fellow uh, Patrick Dubois uh, put this uh, uh, article up called Stop the Fork, and it was just called a Stop Forking like Projects uh, with the idea uh, to you know, do things in a maintainable fashion. Uh, how many folks here uh, try to maintain some sort of fork? Like, uh, yeah, and like how well does that work out, right? Yeah, it's a whole lot better if you know, people can just use your software without having to modify it, then you wouldn't have to fork it, uh, or you know, uh, like getting your contributions accepted upstream. Um, so what I'm gonna do is go through a bit of evolution uh, of, of puppet code uh, that I've, I've done over the years. Um, so the first, uh, when I first started, uh, I wrote the data inside of the class. Uh, how many people have code that looks, that looks like this? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and so here we see I've got a uh, case statement based on what site I'm in. Uh, I've got my different sites and I've got my data and then it's doing something. So like the issues with this is that uh, I can't just share this with you. One, I probably can't share it with you because I'm giving away identifying information. So I might not be able to put this online in the first place because I'm telling you too much uh, insider info. Probably not with DNS client, but with other modules. So I, that prevents me from being able to put it online. So that's not cool. Even if I get there, let's see, I've encoded the data, that's obvious, but I've also encoded what my sites are, and I've encoded that I'm looking it up based on the site. Maybe you don't call it site, maybe you wanna base it based on your store or your environment or something else, and so um, I'm making a lot of assumptions here. This works well for me, 
and not well for you unless you modify it, right? Um, so that's, that's how uh, I, I started out. Um, quickly, this didn't work because in a lot of the different classes, we kept having the same sort of case statements with the same, you know, just with different variables inside. And so we quickly moved to having a uh, uh, set up in the site manifest where uh, here I've got a default node and I'm setting all my variables now and now I have my actual system is going to inherit the default and then in include the classes. How many people are doing this? Yeah. And so what I liked about this is that I am separating at least the uh, variables and stuff out of my classes. So now I could at least share my class online and I'm not like giving away a bunch of like data, but it's still, it's still not awesome because I have all the code or the data inside of the code. Um, what I also found out like using this pattern is that I spent a lot of time editing my code to put in notifies uh, so that I could debug what was going on. And so I spent a lot of time like tracing down why variables were set, how they were. Um, uh, so in 2.6, we got parameterized classes. How many folks uh, have code that looks like this? Yep. Uh, so I, I had just started at Puppet Labs uh, just after 2.6 like, came out in 2010. And uh, I learned about the parameterized classes and immediately was a hater. Uh, and refuse to promote them at all. Um, uh, because what we've done here is now I have name servers as a parameter, right? Uh, but I still have data in code. So this is just similar to this like setup here, only now I use a different syntax to invoke the module, right? But I've got all my data done right there. This could probably be even worse because here I at least just set the data in this ugly thing and it was good throughout the rest of my code even though they had to inherit things which is nasty. Uh, but I only had to set it once. Here I probably had to put the same line for every single node. So I didn't like that. Um, I also didn't like that the parameterized classes didn't work with the Puppet dashboard uh, popular ENC, uh, external node classifier. So we were telling people, here's how to do things, but it doesn't actually work with our software. Yeah. Um, yep. So wasn't a fan of this. Um, it also posed like this problem. So here I have class, like DNS client. I've got a default, uh, or no like default here. I just have like name servers. So I have to pass this attribute in. So if I do this, it works, and I've got my data in there. If I just do an include, this blows up and says you must pass name servers, right? Or where does it get that info? So uh, that's not good. I didn't think that was uh, in the right direction. Uh, how many folks ha have classes that are parameterized? Like, could I see the show of hands? Uh, and how many people have classes that don't have defaults? They've got something like this. Yeah. No? Yeah, so we can put in some sort of sane like default, and if you do this, then at least you can do the include, and it works. Uh, so with parameterized classes, sane defaults are good. Uh, at least then include works. I don't have to use the parameterized class syntax to uh, declare the class anymore. So that was a plus. Um, cool. Here, I can go back and I can, I've got the same defaults, uh, but if I want to, I could overwrite it with the ugly uh, data encode method. Yeah. How many folks are doing this? Does it, like, does this look familiar? Yeah. How many people here are running Puppet 2.6? How many people are running something earlier than Puppet 2.6? Yeah, we're not gonna laugh for too long at you. It's, it's safe to put your hand up, okay. Uh, how about 2.7? No one? Uh, three? Okay. Uh, right on. 
Uh, like, did anyone here use an uh, ENC, external node classifier? Yeah. And so how external node classifiers work, their, their purpose is to be able to query some other source of truth. And so uh, let's say you already have a database of all your systems. You could just add another column for what classes you want associated with those systems. So is it a web server database or something? So if you already had this thing, you could add uh, more information to it and query it directly. Uh, to write an ENC is actually really simple. It's just a uh, script that runs that takes the cert name as the argument, and then it expects uh, a YAML like this to standard out. And so if you have the database, you could write something that you know, does a SQL-like query and outputs it in YAML. Uh, lots of people started writing LDAP-based ENCs. Is anyone using that? No? Uh, those were popular but ran into problems in that people didn't actually already have all this information in LDAP, so they were spending all this time building LDAP stuff and uh, uh, like managing it through that, which isn't very awesome. So the e ENCs were great, because now I could put the, like, the data in the ENC and not in my code. Uh, so things are getting better. Uh, how, how many people use EXT Lookup? Oh. And so EXT Lookup was a uh, uh, tool written by Ari Pinear, and uh, or Pinar, excuse me. And so here I've got a function and it's going to take some key, like name servers, and get it back here. Uh, the, uh, this was awesome because there was no data in the code. Um, it didn't support hashes or arrays, so it was pretty limited uh, to what it could do. Um, it also uh, required you to have this external tool, EXT Lookup, installed, and there wasn't really a way within Puppet to detect if you had it installed, so you couldn't say, like, if ext lookup is missing, fail the catalog, right? Like, there wasn't that mechanism. So uh, it worked as long as you had the tool installed. People read the readme and did it right, you know, they could get it going. So this is a step in the right direction. Uh, how many people have seen uh, this pattern, where you have a params class, and then you use inheritance? Yeah, so this was uh, big for a while, and I still see this out there. So this is, this is bad because you're inheriting just to get uh, values for variables. And so the only time you should ever use inheritance in your code is when you need to override an attribute of one of your resources, um, so you're not duplicating resources. Uh, getting it just to get variables um, is really hacky, and so... Uh, here we have DNS client inherits DNS client params. Uh, I've got name servers, and then it's equal to the variable in that namespace. And then here in params is where I do my lookup stuff. Um, again, here I'm still basing it on site, so that's, that's not great because that's pretty, uh, that means you have to have something called site and it needs to be set to something and I'm still hard coding a lot of data. Uh, so I was a big hater on this. Uh, uh, I will say, though, that Puppet Labs is going back, and I see in a lot of their code where they were using this, they're getting rid of, they still have params, but they're using includes instead of inherits, and are moving away from this. And so that's a positive. Um, cool. Uh, how many folks are using Hira? Right? And that's uh, Hira, not Hira. Uh, uh, Ari would want you to know Hira. Okay. Uh, so Hira uh, is interesting, uh, but it has sort of, uh, a similar issue to ext lookup in that I have to have the tool installed. I can't really check if it's installed or not. Um, but here the data is not in the code anymore. So here I'm, I'm using this function. It's looking up this key, DNS client uh, name servers. And if it doesn't find it, I've got a same default to use. All right. So now we're getting better. Uh, 
Cool. So let's uh, let's go into a demo for high res. Is that, is that large enough for people to read? I realize you can't read words blue, but uh, uh, cool. So what, what Hyra allows you to do is look up uh, these variables, uh, but it allows you to do it in a hierarchical like, like nature. So we define the hierarchy. Here. And so it has a pluggable backend. So people use JSON, YAML, Redis, MySQL, LDAP, all sorts of things. Um, I'm using just the default YAML because uh, it's, it's easy to work with. Um, and so here I'm specifying a hierarchy to look up keys. And so I start with the most specific thing to look up, which for me is the FQDN, so on a uh, host basis. Uh, then I'm going to environment, like dev, production, QA, that sort of thing. Um, I'm defining something else in my hierarchy called site now. And so this is up to you how you define this. And so here I, I define site. So now I don't have site in my code. I have it here. And I can use site because that's what I like to use. But maybe you call it pop or you call it store or that doesn't apply to you, right? So you have different things that you key off of. These, these variables come from factor, like by the way. And then I have the, the least specific thing, like common. What this allows me to do is say, uh, in different data centers, I want to use different name servers, different LDAP servers. You know, uh, uh, Based on whether you're in dev or production, I want to change passwords uh, for the database. right? So then uh, devs don't have to know the production one. Um, this lets me set root passwords, whether at a global level, or I can override it and say, well, if you're in dev, it's this. Or if you're in dev and you're in this site, it's, it's this. Or for these specific hosts, it's this, right? And so if, if the key isn't found here, it just goes to the next one, goes to the next one, goes to the next one until it finds the key. Yeah. Uh, what, this, what this gives me is the power to really have a data-driven infrastructure. And so uh, I can keep my data here, not in the code, which is good, because now we can share code. Uh, the data's not there. And I get this data-driven approach. And so I can download and use code, not fork it, and I just put in the data, uh, like what name servers to use, what time servers I use, you know, where to uh, like talk to things. Uh, so let's take a look at this. We can use Hira from the command line. Um, and so I've got some files already in here, different things. Uh, each of these has a key in there called test. So if I look, um, I see it's got a key called test. And I just put the value equal to the name of the file. So it's apparent where it's like coming from. guys get the idea here? OK. Um, so I can say, Hira, I want to look up test. And it's going to pull it from common. Remember, this is my hierarchy. Or I could say, Hira test, um, but my site is Charlotte. And so now it's going to pull data from here. And so maybe I have different, you know, different servers that I access when I'm in Charlotte compared to when I'm in Atlanta, or right, because I want to keep traffic local or I have different passwords or things like that. Um, here I can say my environment is dev. Um, so what's, what's this going to return? What's that? Uh, yeah, this, this should return dev, uh, because dev is higher uh, in the hierarchy. Right. If I put FQDN, 
it's going to return from that because it's more specific. That's how I have the hierarchy like set up. What's great about this is if I want to change the hierarchy, all I have to do is modify this file or drop and then restart the Puppet Master and the hierarchy's changed. Uh, right now I have data in there for uh, CLT and Indy. Uh, so I want to get a data center in Atlanta. You know, I can uh, create a new file, put my data in there, and then, you know, now I'm pulling data from there, right? And so it makes it really incredibly easy to work with. Uh, I can give access to this, like maybe to different groups. So if you're in dev, maybe you have access to the dev.yaml and you can change all the things you want there, but you don't have access to the rest. Uh, this is great also for exposing uh, tunables for your site. And so maybe you're running Apache or Tomcat or something uh, and you've templated out your configuration settings. And so I can make all of those <laughs> variables accessible here. And so a dev who might not you know, understand Puppet or like where to go to edit the config files or you know how you're supposed to edit the config files because they're making their eyes bleed looking at XML for Tomcat or something. And so they could look at this like YAML file, you know, tweak the numbers, and then uh, that's how the system is going to look. So it makes it really data driven in that aspect. Um, like any questions about Hira or what I'm covering so far? Okay. So the question is, uh, uh, are param classes OK to choose OSs? Is that what you're saying? Well, you, uh, whenever you install a package, you have to choose to tell it which, OS, which packages to install based on the OS. Yeah. And I'm putting that type of OS-specific logic in my params class. That's not like a good idea. Yeah, well, you could just have it in your main class, and then people can override it or not, and then you don't have to have subclasses for that sort of thing. Um, so here's, here's what I did uh, next. So here I've got this name servers here. So uh, I, I have this design pattern with a data subclass. So this is similar to the param subclass, but I'm not using inheritance. And so here I have include DNS client data. Uh, and DNS client data is where I make the high recall. Uh, and then here I'm setting name servers. Uh, to this, to the, the name server's variable from this uh, class, and so I'm bringing it into the local scope. Uh, the reason I did that is so I didn't have to modify the templates. Um, if you didn't do that, then in your template you'd have to modify it and use scope.lookup var so that I could actually find where your variable was. Um, this seemed a little bit better, but it still had the issues of uh, you know, they had to have Hira installed. Um, uh, this was a little kludgy uh, here, because now, you know, why not just reference it directly, right? Um, so then uh, Puppet version 3 came out, and so uh, now I'm back to parameterized classes. And so uh, here I've got a, uh, my class that's parameterized, but I've got a same default, which is important, um, because this allows me to just do include, and I don't have to use the parameterized class like syntax. I can just say in include. Are you instantiating the DNS client class for everybody? Like globally, you're just setting the defaults for that class now? Uh, so the question was, am I like setting these defaults like globally? And so anytime you include DNS client, uh, it, it would just use these like, like defaults. Yep. Uh, so what, what Puppet 3 like gave us is uh, data lookups. And so uh, here I've got class foo attribute class default. So if I just include foo, 
my attribute is going to be the class by default, right? Uh, so nothing, nothing new there. Uh, here, uh, I'm using the parameterized class-like syntax, uh, which I was uh, complaining about before because we have data in code. But now it's saying attribute, and now it's going to use param data because that's more specific than just this default, right? Like I'm telling it, use that data. Yep. Uh, you don't actually want to do this. This is bad. Um, so declaring the parameterized classes is evil because we've got data in the code now, right? And that's the whole thing we want to get away from so we can share code. Yeah. Uh, that's not awesome. So defining parameterized classes is awesome. Uh, so I can put same like defaults. So that's good. Uh, and it's really awesome because I can do lookups now uh, in Hira automatically. And so the way that works is I put my class, colon, colon, and then my attribute. And I put this as a key somewhere in the hierarchy. And so now Hira is going to look for this uh, and return it. If it doesn't find it, then it would just use the uh, defaults for, like, for my class. And so I'm able to write code that looks like this. You can just include it and use it. Uh, if you don't want your root password to be puppet, then you just set this key in Hira. But it's up to you where you set the key. Remember, like when we started with DNS client, I, 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 was, I had a case statement based on the site like that I was in, because that worked for me. But you don't care about site. Like you want to base it uh, based on what environment you're in, or what store you're at, or some other uh, key. So none of that's in here. I, I don't say where you're getting the data from. It's up to you to define the hierarchy. It's up to you to define where do I want to look for things. You know, like, where do I make that decision? And you just put that in there somewhere. So this could be at the FQDN level that you're setting the password. It could be at the common level. It could be based on your store. It could be based on any number of things. Uh, so I'll show a demo of that. So this is my uh, DNS client uh, class. Um, and so this, this module I wrote in order to showcase how to write a good module. Like we all know what Etsy Resolve Conf is for. Uh, we all need to manage it on our systems probably. And so I, I, I chose it because it's simple. There's only one resource, a file. It's very well documented. Uh, <coughs> What, like, what it supports, and there's only a few options that you can like, put in there. And so I wanted to choose something seemingly very simple that everyone used to sort of showcase how to, how to write a good module. So it's a, a good resource to look at uh, online to you know, uh, like check out. And so here we see I've got data that you would expect, name servers, options, search path, domain, sort list. Um, I have other things that you might not think about as Bing data. So I've got the path to Etsy Resolve Conf. Because um, I'm managing the contents of this file, but I don't really care where it's at. I mean, I do, like I want an Etsy Resolve Conf, but it could be somewhere else. And so that's, that's, that's data. Uh, it should probably be a file in root root 0644 but maybe you want it to be something else. Again, to me, that's, that's data, just like what the name servers are is data. And so I want to abstract all that out so that if you wanted it somewhere else and you wanted it in a different mode or group or something, you could change all of this via Hira and never have to touch the code. And that's, that's, that's the goal, is to give you flexibility so that you can use it without having to fork it. Right. Um, so if I just include this class as it is, I'll get uh, my name server set here. I'll get options, rotate and timeout one. And it'll put it Etsy Resolve Conf root root 0644. 
And so let's see an example of that. Um, oh, yeah. G Honeycut uh, Puppet Dash Module Dash DNS Client. Yeah, the joys here of uh, running a few VMs on my poor laptop. We'll see what this comes out with. I've already included the DNS client uh, or associated it with this node via an include. Uh, so just, it should just get the defaults. There we go. So if I look at resolve conf, gives me all, all the uh, header, you know, don't mess with this. Uh, and we get the data that you would expect, right? Um, so I can override this in Hira now. So I'm going to set DNS client to something else. Um, Alan, what's the uh, name servers you're using here? Are, are, are you running your own? What's that? 172.16.3.4.1.1.2.3.2.1.3.6.1. Here, I just put this in here. So now I'm, I'm going to use different name servers uh, for this. Um, let's say I also want to change, so we can look at this code again. I also want to change my search path. Uh, so I think it was called search. DNS client search, and I want to search um, uh, here. Okay, so I didn't have to modify my code. I just put this in high rest like somewhere. Now we'll run the puppet agent again. Let it do its thing and hopefully not blow up on me. Cool. And so we see here it changed. Uh, now I have a search path set and my name servers are uh, like different. Yeah. So that shows how I was able to put things in Hira. Um, and I didn't have to modify the code. Um, now, only on this host, I actually want to manage, um, let's see what that option was called, where the config file is. For some crazy reason, I actually want to put this under temp resolve.conf, right? So now I'm doing it at another level in the hierarchy. So at this FQDM level for this host, I'll put it there. Um, so I did that by specifying it at the FQDM level. Let's cat temp resolve conf. That's where we put it. Okay. Tick that puppet. All right. So again, if I didn't screw this up, it should create a uh, temp resolve conf and uh, with our options. Cool. So here we see the temp resolve conf, and so it's 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 taking the option of where to put it from the FQDM level, but then as it goes down in the hierarchy, as it searches for these other variables like search and name server, it's pulling them from common, so they can get pulled from different levels of the of the hierarchy. Not not all of your values have to be you know in each one, right?
Yeah. So the question was, if you got your names through DHCP, how would you like deal with that? Yeah. Um, this current implementation doesn't touch that, so you would need to set where your name servers were. Yeah, so the question was, does Factor hand that to you? So yeah, you could get information from Factor and put that in the hierarchy or something. Yeah. Cool. Right on. So your code should be here. Uh, this, this, is, this is where everybody's like putting their puppet code. Uh, so you should be there as well. It'll make it a lot easier for you to contribute uh, to the other modules and work, work with improving things if you're in the same spot. Um, when you create your module, uh, you should give it the name puppet-module your name, like puppet module DNS client, as opposed to puppet-DNS client. Um, so this is sort of the, the, the naming standard for, for that. When you go and create your uh, repository on GitHub, um, you're going to want to generally seed it with a readme and uh, a git ignore. Just select Ruby, and one of your first commits is probably going to be to add, uh, to ignore this uh, puppet stuff so it doesn't get uh, committed to your repository. Uh, like, how many folks are using uh, git? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so next, uh, I didn't think that in a, a talk about writing puppet code, I would have a demo for how to write a readme, but uh, that's pretty important. And in fact, uh, I often write uh, the readme first for the options uh, before I actually write the code, so that that way I've given thought to what all my options are, as well as given thought to what the types are. Um, so let's show that. Actually, let's just show that in the web browser. Come on, Wi-Fi. All right. And so in my readme, um, the first things I put is uh, just a quick description of what's going on. And then I'm going to want to have a section for compatibility. So what, what have I tested this on? Uh, so I'm going to have a list of that. That way people can easily look at it and see, you know, is, is this supported for me or not? Uh, or maybe it does work, but, you know, they haven't tested it on that system, right? Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm guessing that Slackware also uses an Etsy Resolve Conf. Yes. Uh, Fairly standard, so this probably works on Slackware just like everything else here. Uh, I just haven't had a system to test it on. So uh, somebody could like use this, show that it works, send me a pull request for also support Slackware, and then there you go. Uh, so I want to document all my parameters as well. And so this is sort of a, a layout uh, that Puppet Labs has adopted and I've adopted here. Uh, that just shows what all of the attributes, all the parameters, what they are. Notice I list what the type is. So it's not just where you list your name servers, it's an array of name servers, or it's a string, or it's a Boolean, right? So, or it's a hash. But here's where you put you know, what you expect it to be for type, as well as I'm putting what the default is. So I'm defaulting to Google's public like, name servers, or my options, I default to rotate and timeout one. I think you should use that. Uh, so it's important to put this down. I often want to do this before I write any code. I'll like document this. Uh, that way, I'm 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 actually thought out. What, like, what are the things I want to manage? Uh, yeah. Uh, things to help with this. Uh, this is written in Markdown. You can get a uh, Vim plugin for Markdown, but it's not very awesome. 
Um, it just makes it not look too terrible. Um, uh, there's also other just markdown utilities that you can get, so I'd, I'd, I'd recommend like getting something like that. Um, cool. Yeah, so the, the uh, response was uh, GitHub has a utility for this, and yeah, like we saw, I was showing the GitHub page, and so uh, you know, it'll, it'll automatically show your readme.md or readme.markdown, and it'll automatically format it so when you go to the page, it just shows up. Um, cool. Uh, so the next part of, the, uh, of your module should be a module of file. How many people here start off creating their modules with MakeDir? Anyone? No, so folks are using Puppet Module Generate. Yeah, good. And so it'll create some boilerplate info for you for what's in the module file. So the module file is basically a bunch of metadata about your module. So it has uh, the name of it, you know, versions, source, all that good stuff, licensing. Um, it has dependency, like tracking as well. So you can uh, like do that. What this gives you is the ability to um, search on the forge. So you could go to forge.puppetlabs.com and look through the web UI there. Um, or we could actually search here. So look for my rsync module. And so maybe it'll get there and it'll show, uh, won't get there, of course. Uh, and it won't get there because uh, I blew up my resolver. <laughs> All right, but you could search online there. Um, yeah, for your code as well as install it. And so by having the dependencies, it's able to actually uh, install those as well. Um, the versioning here, like notice I got 3.03, I think it's 3.04, I think I, I, I pushed another fix, I think this morning in someone else's talk. Um, and it's, it's using semantic versioning. How many people here are using semantic versioning for their uh, public code? Yeah? How many people are using semantic versioning somewhere else? Who's never heard of semantic versioning before? Okay. Uh, if you've read this issue where you have, uh, you're looking at versions and it's different like between projects, right? So this place has like, like 0 0.9 forever uh, and they keep putting like letters after it or this project has, you know, 1.2.3.4.5 and this project just has like, uh, get, like hashes. Um, so like what does that stuff mean? And so Semver is a standard uh, for versioning. Uh, you can go to semver.org. It's like a two-page read. It's, it's super short. Uh, I'll just break down what's going on here. So this first number is the major number. And when you increment the major number, you can break backwards compatibility. So this is where you can break the API. Uh, you know, things change here. Uh, the next number is the feature release. So if you add a new feature, you bump that number. And the third digit is for bug fixes only, right? And so I can look at this code, and if something starts with a zero, like it's, it's before the 1.2.3, uh, uh, then it's, it's, it's beta level code, right? Like it hasn't hit the first uh, level where, you know, uh, it's like usable. Uh, so you can look at these and easily understand what's going on. If it goes from version three to version four, it could very likely break things, and I, like, I need to really test it. What this allows me to do is things like this. So I'm dependent on version 3.2.x because that actually means something and isn't just some number some guy like, came up with. This is like a promise. This is only bug fixes. So I'll get any bug fix in here. I'll be dependent on that version. If I wanted to live a little more on the edge and I also want feature releases as well, 
I could have just put 3.x, and then I would have got th uh, feature releases in that branch as well. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Who here is using Puppet Lint? No one? Has anyone read the uh, Puppet Lab style guide? Excellent. Uh, so uh, the Puppet Lab style guide talks about a lot of really exciting things like two, sp like, uh, two spaced uh, indentations and no hard tabs or trailing white space. It's a, a riveting read that I'm uh, glad that I got to contribute to. Uh, I'm glad I got to contribute to it, but it's pretty boring. Uh, it does give you, though, uh, more than just how to handle tabs and white spaces and things like this. It tells you how to handle you know, having defaults for case statements uh, and, and a bit more into the code. So it, it is worthwhile to read. Uh, I worked hard to have it versioned. And so uh, for you, you can say, I adhere to version whatever of the Puppet Lab style guide. And that way, people that you're writing code with have an understanding that you know, we're going to adhere to this. Uh, uh, each of the sections is numbered, so you can also say we adhere to version 1.2.3 of the Puppet Lab style guide, except for section 10.1.5 because they're crazy and we do it this way, right? But then at least people that you work with, they know what's going on and everyone is together on what's acceptable like for the code. Um, so what Puppet Lint does is it enforces style. It's not, uh, va it's not validating syntax, that's puppet parser validate. It's just uh, like vetting style. So let's take a look at that. Actually, um, so here I can type puppet lint, and I can point it to my code. And it didn't complain. Everything's good. Um, I'll just do a, a not that exciting error, but uh, uh, now my hash rockets aren't aligned. I've got trailing white space. Um, so I'll run puppet lint again, and it complains and says, you're not doing it right, and you have trailing white space right there. So, I'll go fix that up so it stops complaining. All right, I could also type rake lint, uh, which gives me all sorts of issues with this. Um, if you're using uh, uh, puppet lint, I highly recommend creating a dot puppet lint RC, and you can tell it to ignore certain things. So there's a problem with the puppet lab style guide in that someone got in there that no line should be longer than 80 characters. Uh, which I can, I, I, I can sort of see where they're coming from with that in a uh, coding standard, but the puppet language doesn't have a line delimiter. Like you can't put like, you know, a slash at the end and go to the next, like, like you can't break a line. So telling people you can't have a line longer than this isn't, isn't really valid. And so I'd recommend creating a, a puppet line RC and putting no any charge check in there uh, so it doesn't complain about that. Uh, this is the, the type of tool that you want to have in your uh, pre-commit hook for version control. And that way, uh, you also want a pre-commit hook for puppet parser validate, like validate the code actually can parse. Uh, it's easy enough to write bad code, like don't accept code that doesn't parse. Uh, and then you can also run puppet lint over it as well to make sure it's adhering to your standards. Uh, cool. Uh, so next is uh, uh, spec test. How many folks, again, were writing spec tests? All right, so <laughs> we're gonna get changed on that. Um, so first thing for writing spec tests, you have to have a little scaffolding in place. So you'll wanna just grab a .gem file. You can just grab it from my repo or somewhere. Um, and then you also need a fixtures. Um, and the fixtures uh, provide some scaffolding for rake spec. And so I'm telling it first, it needs to create a symlink so it can find the module I'm working on. 
And then I have dependencies. I depend on Puppet Lab standard lib 3.2.0. And so I'm telling it, here's where you can get that code. And specifically, here's what version to get of it. And so you'll need those files. And then you'll need the spec, uh, spec helper, which tells you to use Puppet Lab's spec helper. You have to install that. It's a gem. And it's just Puppet Lab spec helper. Um, yeah. All right. So now I can type rake spec. And it's going to download and check that stuff out. And I get a bunch of little green dots, which is really what you want. And if you screw up, you get capital red Fs. Um, yeah. If I want, I can. So I put my, my spec test under the spec directory. Uh, under classes, and then so I have an init class, so I'll have it init underscore spec to go along with it. There we go. Uh, so here I'm saying when using default values for the class. So here, if I just did include DNS client, I didn't set anything in Hira. It's just the the, the defaults. Uh, my catalog should contain a file resource with this name, and it should have all of those uh, attributes and values, right? Uh, it should also uh, have content, because we, we, we care about that with Etsy Resolve Conf, and it should look just like that. And so ideally, you would even write your test first and do test-driven development. And so you would write this test to say, I want to have this file. Here's the default options. Here's what it should look like. And now I'm going to go write the template that makes that come out. right? So I can keep writing my code, running rake spec, until it goes from fail to the beautiful green dots. Um, cool. I want to show Travis CI. I'm running a little uh, short for time here. Who, who here is using uh, Travis? Yeah? And so what Travis is is continuous integration, and it uh, uh, connects to GitHub. And so within Travis, I can give it the GitHub credentials and say, check this repository. And so for my DNS client, anytime someone uh, commits a branch, uh, Travis is going to go out and check it for me. And so here's what that looks like. Uh, I believe it's just for my branches. Yeah. But you could turn it on for yours as well. And so hopefully it comes back online here. Uh, maybe not, but what this thing is doing is it's actually uh, sp spinning up these uh, like systems and then running the test. And so for that, I need to have a um, dot Travis like YAML. And what's what it's like telling it here is install bundler, um, <coughs> and it's going to run rake spec. So just like we type rake spec, it's doing that for us. Uh, I'm giving it a matrix of environments. So I'm saying test in Ruby 1.9.3 and, and like 1.8.7, as well as Puppet's version 2.7.13 and 3.2.1. And I don't have Ruby 1.9 support working yet, so I expect that to fail. It's OK if it fails. Right. Uh, you can install a gem called Travis Lint, and that will um, do linting on your file and see if it's good or not. Cool. So maybe it's, no, it's not going to happen for me. All right. Uh, so like anyhow, this, is, uh, this would tell you what was going on. If you looked at the uh, pull request, it would tell you whether they passed Travis. Let's see uh, if this shows it here. Maybe. Yeah, 
anyhow, it's a bit slow, but what's, well, like what happens is when someone sends me a pull request, Travis has gone and it's building uh, the system to see if that passes or not. And so before I merge the pull request, it actually turns green and says, this passed like Travis, or it, duck, or it like didn't, right? And so if it didn't pass Travis, I'm probably not gonna merge your pull request, right? And so it allows me to feel more confident in accepting change because now I have spec tests. So now I'm getting uh, quicker feedback if things break, right? And that's, that's really important. I think the network's done. Okay. So I wanted to talk uh, a lot about the common module, but it looks like I'm about out of time and I want to have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so I'm just going to plug it in that uh, you should check out my puppet module common on GitHub. Um, it sets up a lot of uh, common things like NTP, Vim, DNS client. A lot of it's written for enterprise Linux. And so uh, I, I need your help to port it to other things like Slackware and Ubuntu. Uh, and sue some Solaris, um, and I would uh, uh, appreciate that. So I think we're about done. I'm gonna have to skip deploying modules. Um, I just wanna open it up for questions because I only have a few minutes here. So tell me you have a question. I, I heard people say they're gonna wait for me till after the talk. And I'm not going to talk to you after this, so like, <laughs> get the questions in. Yeah. Um, if you're doing uh, like development, let's say I'm doing a vagrant module, should I be doing uh, Git submodules or library and puppet? Yeah. So the question was, should I be using Git submodules or library and puppet? Um, okay, I'm going to show those slides. So. Um, here, here's how to deploy modules. Uh, I looked at library and puppet. Uh, Tim Sharp writes awesome software, uh, but it doesn't look like it's being actively maintained. There's a lot of uh, uh, pull requests that are like sitting there and issues. And so I looked and uh, Dan Bodie wrote uh, Puppet Librarian Simple, which doesn't try to do any of the dependency checks. It just, you give it the Git references and it just downloads it all. And so it works with a, a Puppet file. And a Puppet file, here I'm telling it, um, where to get the code. This is going to assume the master branch. Here I'm giving it a reference. This is a tag. I'm saying get it specifically 3.2.0. I could also put a uh, branch. Here's where I've, I've forked like wget and I'm waiting on them to merge my changes in. Uh, I could also put a hash or something there. Um, so I actually demonstrate how this works. Hopefully the network works. So I've got a modules directory, and I'm going to run library and puppet clean. And it just deleted my modules directory. Um, you can look at my puppet file, and I've got a whole bunch of modules here. And so I can run library and puppet install verbose. And so it's going out and doing these clones. The network's a bit slow, so it might, might be a bit, but. It's, it's like going out and just doing the, the git clones from all of these repositories and then switching to the right reference if like necessary. So this file I keep in another uh, repository and whenever I want to update a module, all I do is update this file in its own repository with like what version I should be like pulling down and then I can just run uh, the library and puppet install, and it pulls everything down for me. Uh, and I don't have to worry about keeping things in sync or, you know, do I have local like versions, like that sort of thing. So I highly recommend puppet library and simple. Yeah. Cool. Nobody's kicking me out of here, so uh, like, ha have any other questions? Right on. Uh, I really need like your guys' help to write better Puppet code. Uh, you use uh, probably the same types of things that you manage that I have to manage, like networks and NS switch and DNS clients and NTP and all that fun stuff. Uh, I'd like to support more operating systems, and so you all use OSs I probably don't get to use. Um, 
or want to use any more AIX. Uh, uh, but I want those like contributions, so I'm looking to you for, for help for that. And so uh, if you get a hold of me and you want to work together on these things, I'm more than happy to uh, teach you how to set up Git and use GitHub and make those contributions. Uh, right on. Like, thanks, everybody. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astrospace systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astris or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astris. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked.
plant stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. 
you can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.